And now, from beyond our dimension, this is the Jeff Mara Podcast. Here's Jeff. My guest is Megan Brown, who during her near-death experience went to heaven and saw numerous beings, which we're going to learn about and more. Megan, thank you for joining me and welcome. Oh, thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Megan, let's start with a little bit of your backstory and then go right into your NDE. Okay. So I was raised um, a Roman Catholic and a very strict um, upbringing and dysfunctional. <laughs> but um, then I became an atheist when I was 20. Um, it wasn't until my near-death experience in 2007 uh, where I became a believer. I'll just say believer because I won't lock myself into um, a religion, so to speak. Mm -hmm. um, I think it kind of, I don't know, it, 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 it misses the point because the point is about love. So love is not a religion. All right. So what happened with your NDE? How did I get to that point to the NDE? I'm not sure how it happened. Like, were you in a car accident or what? Yeah. So um, I actually, I was working out all the time, doing my yoga, so on and so forth. And one night I came home and my stomach just, it was so upset. And then it, it was just pain, 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 pain in, in my back. And I was trying to do all these yoga positions, trying to like calm my body but it just progressively got worse and worse throughout the night. So it turned out, long story short, it turned out to be C. diff colitis, but the C. diff colitis um, was treated. And after being treated, it should have been gone within three or four days. I was still having excruciating pain. So I kept complaining of pain and I had a hospitalist tell me that, you know, oh, I've given you, you know, two milligrams of morphine. I've upped it to four milligrams of morphine. I'm, I've given you all of this stuff and uh, you shouldn't be in pain anymore. I think you're a drug seeker and I'm laying there. Oh my gosh, you know? And so for the first time I heard something, someone talk to me, but I didn't know who it was. And I heard, make a scene, make it big or you won't make it out. So I happened to be in a Catholic hospital at the time when this happened. And I thought, well, I know how to offend Catholics. I just say a few things and miraculously I will offend everybody, <laughs> which I did. So I got the attention that I needed and um, I fired that doctor, that hospitalist. And um, then I don't know how much time went by, but another one walked in and she looked at me and I scanned her with my eyes and I heard something again, and I heard, you can relax. She knows what she's doing. And I'm thinking, who is telling me this? What, where is this coming from, you know? So then I just, she looked at me, did a, a test, and it turned out I was in kidney failure. So it was so bad because for days they let me drag on where they didn't um, identify what it was that I was dealing with. So, um, yeah, then they got me to dialysis. And as it turns out, it took them a number of days to figure out I have a rare autoimmune disease that kicks in um, to women primarily uh, in their mid to late 30s, which is where I was. So um, that's how it started. And um, it got to a point where I just went into my near-death experience I like closed my eyes and I was told I could relax and um I don't remember except I, once I can remember waking up but there was a two-week period of time where I can't tell you what happened except this one meeting it was very very strange with the um the dialysis nurse and um I had opened uh, I was I'd opened my eyes I grabbed her wrist as she was doing the procedure on me and I looked at her and I said, you have to get me off this floor or I'm going to die here. And she said, oh, well, that's too much paperwork for me. Uh, my husband runs the sixth floor. It's the sickest floor in the hospital. I'm going to have you moved. And then I, I was out of it again. So they moved me to another floor and it, and it just, it went on from there. So 
Um, I remember walking uh, through the clouds um, and I remember it looking like earth. So there was the grass, there were trees, there were the clouds in the sky. It was like 72 degrees, sunny, and there's Jesus standing under this tree and he's waiting for me. And I looked at him and I was so surprised. I was like, oh my gosh, you really do exist. And he looked at me and he laughed and he extended his arms out. And then, you know, it was like, okay, I can come forward and give him a hug. And so he gives me a hug and then he says, come on, I've got a lot of work to do with you. And, or he said, come on, we've got a lot of work to do. And I said, I know you're dealing with me, you know? So um, he took me to meet my other guides and my other guides were Archangel Michael, El Moria, Mother Mary and St. Germain. And we went into this golden capsule and I had to watch my life review. And so they were, it was like, you know, I swear to you, it was like a therapist. You're standing there, you're watching every single second of your life. And then any, any happy times, traumatic times, anything, they would pause it and say, okay, how do you feel right here? And then you, I heard what the other person was thinking. So it was so complex and I was like compounded with emotion, not just from me, but from the other person in the scene or the other people that were in the circumstance with me or situation, whatever it was. So um, it was really amazing. And then after I had um, uh, witnessed my life review, at the very end, they said, okay, how do you feel right now? And I just stood there and I said, this too shall pass. And I don't remember what they were referring to when they asked me how I was feeling. But when I said, this too shall pass, they said, oh, you've got it. And so I thought, okay, you know, and then the next thing that I remember is being taken into another golden capsule and these cherubs, they don't talk, um, they're all gold and they were fluttering around and they were just, it's like, how do they do this? They, well, it was like a white robe, okay? So, or a toga is what I say. And then they put a gold, it was a white stole over me and it had um, like gold in it. And then there was a little earth emblem down at the bottom, which meant visitor. That was their code for visitor. And, um, and then all of a sudden Archangel Michael walked in and I was like, oh my God, you know, <laughs> and I already feel horrible. I, I used some foul language <laughs> in heaven. I won't use it on here, but I did because that's who I was fresh off earth. And, um, and he looked at me and he started talking to me and he was very kind and he's black by the way. And he's gorgeous. I mean, he's just absolutely beautiful with this long hair to like his shoulders and it's wavy and thick and these beautiful, I can't remember. It's like his eyes changed, you know? I saw him with blue eyes. I saw him with like these like uh, almost a light hazel. I don't know how to um, describe it. And um, I remember he was so kind to me and had... Uh, just this feeling of unconditional love. And I'd never felt that before. So I looked at him and I started crying and he says, Megan, why are you crying? And I said, because I've been so mean to you guys. I've called you all these names from earth, which I will edit right now. And I said, um, I, you know, I can't believe I'm here in heaven that you and Jesus have been so nice to me. And he says, Megan, I'm not here to judge you. I'm here to love you. And so I was like, oh my gosh, feeling even worse. So he um, put up his right hand and the uh, a, a white beam of light came out and was hitting my soul, which is right in the chest area between the breastbone. And um, he was saying the Aramaic version of Psalm 91. And so I was like, wow, what is this? So after he did that, then... He took me out of the capsule and then there were my other guides. And then we all started walking toward temple. So I had no idea what was happening. Zero. 
And they said, come on, others are waiting to meet you. And I said, there are people waiting to meet me? And they didn't say who. And I said, yes, they, or they said yes. And I said, okay. And so um, there, were, there was a little cherub in one, on each side of this huge temple and it was white and it, like these little decks. And then these cherubs were playing these golden trumpets. Um, and it was the announcement that I was coming. And so I'm watching this just like, I, I'm absolutely beside myself because I was such an atheist. So Jesus goes and opens up the door. And then um, I think the other three or four um, guides went in and then I went in after them. And then Jesus came in behind me. And so I watched my other guides sit down at this golden table and there was one chair left. Well, actually two. And so Jesus came up to my left and pulled out the chair and that I was to sit in and I sat down and then he sat down to my left and to my right was Archangel Michael. And then it was Archangel Gabriel, Archangel Raphael. I mean, oh, there were 27 archangels. I can't even remember them. Archangel Azriel, Archangel, um, gosh, who were they all? Zadkiel. Um, there were so many. And then to Jesus's left was God, but I didn't know who this guy was. So I'm sitting there and he just starts talking and I'm sitting there and I'm like, who is this guy? What is he talking about? Why are all these people listening to him? You know, I had no idea what was going on. It felt amazing to be in this space. Absolutely amazing. All I could feel was love and welcoming. That's all I could feel. But I was, I'm sitting there wondering who is this guy? And all of a sudden, he said, and Megan will be going back to earth. And in my head alone, I said, oh, F, you know, and I didn't say it out loud. And he, God stopped talking and he looked at me and he says, oh, F is right, Megan. And he said, be careful what you wish for, because I hear those too. And then I flashed back on my catechism days and growing up in the Roman Catholic Church. And I went, oh my gosh. So that was the moment that I knew it was God. And then I said, oh, your holiness. Um, you know, I can't even remember like all of these ways in which I was trying to stumble over getting, you know, my apology through to get his forgiveness. And so he smiled and he says, I've already forgiven you. And I was like, oh, okay, good. You know, and then he says, Megan, we just want you to be yourself. And everybody was watching me. And I sat there and I was real comfortable with God at that moment. And I put my arm up on the golden chair that I was sitting in and I, I slouched down and I said, well, <laughs> then, okay, fine. I'll just be myself, you know? And um, everybody started laughing. So there were messages um, that were given to me and I had to walk around the table 77 times because there were 77 of us, but I don't remember every message. I just remember some of the really, uh, the ones that I remember for some reason I'm supposed to remember even to this day. Um, like one was when I got around to White Eagle, um, my grandmother, when I was a teenager had given me this little book called The Quiet Mind by White Eagle. And um, I knew that he had poetry. So uh, he looked at me and he said, Megan, he says, when you come across um, a white feather, it's not a tribal thing. He says, I want you to think about it. Are you doing or are you being? I have never forgotten that, Jeff. I, I looked at him like, oh my gosh, I got to an answer right now. And then I didn't say anything and he could see like the concern on my face. Like I wanted to answer it correctly. And he says, no, no, don't answer it now. He says, just, just think about it. Just think about it. So there were other messages that came out in that um, time in there. And then um, there was one point when I remember I had the opportunity to go through this giant wooden door and I looked back at God and the table, everybody sitting at the table. And I said, so you mean to tell me if I go through this door, I can go into heaven and I don't have to go back to earth anymore. 
And they all said in unison, yes, with a smile on their face. And I looked at them all and I said, oh, well, now my Catholic guilt is kicking in. I said, forget it. I'm, I'm, I'm just going to go back as you've all instructed me to do. And they all started laughing because I was keeping it light and, you know, I was taking them seriously, but I was trying to make a joke too. But anyway, so yeah. And then I went into heaven and there were um, different things that happened in there too. You were still there with them, right? Right. Okay, and then, so then did you just wake up in your body or what happened next? Oh, no, 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 I didn't. Um, as a matter of fact, that was just the beginning. So it meant if I went through that wooden door, that meant that I quote unquote died. Well, nobody dies, as, mm -hmm. as I found out. No one dies. You you think you're going to die because it's so earth. It, it's such an earth term, I promise you. But um, nobody dies. So had I gone through that wooden door, I would have stayed there in heaven and I would not be alive on earth right now. However, I stayed there with them inside temple and continued talking to God and goddess and all of these other souls. And then they took me into um, heaven. So I was brought in as a guest and I got to experience um, meetings with uh, different um, people. I'll say people because they look like people, you know, although heaven is not a bunch of people that look like you and I. I mean, there are the ones that look like people, like God looks like a person. Jesus looks like Jesus. Okay, so they all look like people sitting at the table with me. But then there are other souls from other planets that go there. So it's kind of like the bar scene in Star Wars. So that's what heaven's like. You know, that's all I can think of is the bar scene in Star Wars, which I think George Lucas was just so like tapped into something that the rest of us didn't know about. But now having been there, I'm like, oh, yeah, Star Wars. 1970s version perfect yeah that's it so you were there you were with god jesus and other and the archangels but who else did you see there so at one point um i'm walking down the sidewalk in heaven and i'm by myself and and all of a sudden i could feel that there was somebody in front of me and i looked up and it's freddie mercury and i'm like oh my god I've been a Freddie Mercury fan since fifth grade. So I looked at him and I said, you're Freddie Mercury. And he looks at me and he says, yeah. And he's standing there in his t-shirt and shorts. And he goes, so, um, so how are you doing? And I said, oh, I'm feeling horrible. I'm in kidney failure on earth right now. I'm in so much pain. I don't want to go back. It's just a horrible experience down there. And he goes, oh, he goes, well, I'm sorry to hear that. Do you want to um, go have some fun? And I said, yes. And so he says, come on. And so I followed him, you know, he turned around and we walked together and we went to this like outdoor arena. And I remember standing, like all of a sudden there were all these other souls, you know, I'm sure visitors from heaven and those who were staying in heaven. Um, and then there were angels in there too, and archangels. And, and then Freddie Mercury was gone. And then I remember this show starting and the show started with, um, it was like being at a concert, okay? But the show started with Spike Jones and Billy Barty, who go back to like, what, the 40s and 50s? And um, and I'm going, oh my gosh. And it was, you know, it was it was comedy and they were doing singing and dancing. And, and then after them, it was Cole Porter and Ella Fitzgerald. And then after them, it was the group Queen. However... The group Queen, I say, because it was Freddie Mercury singing and on piano. But Terry Kath was on guitar. Buddy Rich was on drums. Marvin Gaye, um, he was also on piano. Um, and uh, what was his name? Rick James. So it was, it was a very interesting um, band. But it was such a blast. And I just remember dancing. And I remember dancing with other souls around me who were also wearing the white, you know, togas or whatever so it was it was so much fun and then after the concert I remember I was taken back to a tent and inside the tent it was the tent that I was staying in okay so they had me like that was my room while I was there so they had me staying in this tent and it was purple on the inside 
It was this beautiful royal purple. And um, it was huge. And there was this table of, um, it was a very, very long table because all of the archangels that were in temple with me, they were sitting at this table as well. And then everybody who I just mentioned was sitting at the table and we were all, we all started talking and all of a sudden um, we're laughing, we're telling jokes. And then all of these cherubs start flying in um, from the exterior of the tent and the whole room starts to light up and there were 300 cherubs and all of a sudden walks in prophet Muhammad and I met him in, in temple in, when I very first got to heaven. So here he is again. And I'm thinking, wait, why are you here? Oh, wow. So we all stood up, you know, and we bowed. And then he, he gently did that, telling us to sit down. And then he looked directly at me and he said, Megan, when you go back, I want you to tell everyone that I am constantly praying for the Middle East. I have never stopped being there for them. I am there for everyone, even including me, okay, including you. So he prays for everybody. And so I looked at him and he, he gives me these messages. And then I respectfully asked him, why do you want me to tell this message? I don't understand. I'm not, I'm, I, I don't know anything about your teachings. I grew up Catholic, like in California, you know, what am I supposed to do? Uh, and he said to me, I have my ways. And he said, just tell everybody I love them. And I thought, okay, I can do that. You know? So after he left the tent, then all of the angels followed him. And then we all sat around quiet. I mean, you could hear a pin drop in that moment. And then somebody started talking and I think it was I'm trying to remember, I don't remember which one started talking first, but all of a sudden, um, Freddie Mercury, or no, 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 it was Marvin Gaye. And he said, you know, he said, I wish, Megan, that you would go back and talk about the, um, the civil rights movement and being black in that period of time and how difficult it was for me and others and how we were spat on and all of this stuff. So it felt like it was becoming this political thing, right? Or uh, I'm not political. So <laughs> I'm like sitting there going, okay, why would you be telling me? I, I like, I don't understand, you know? But each one of these souls told me their struggles and trauma as a human on earth. And so for Marvin Gaye and Rick James, Ella Fitzgerald, Cole Porter, every single one of them talked about the civil rights movement and what it was like to be black and how they were totally unfairly treated and how they were, uh, I mean, it, the stories were just like, it was the saddest, it was the saddest thing, you know, to hear. And then I remember Freddie Mercury piping in and saying, you know, it wasn't easy for me to transition during the height of my career from being a heterosexual to a homosexual. And, you know, and he goes into how he felt and that he had a message for his then partner who was with him when he passed and that he always loved him, you know, and that he was so grateful that he was in his life. And then Billy Barty, who I'd met a couple of times, once as a kid and then again as an adult. Um, but years before this near-death experience happened to me. And he said, you know, it was very difficult being from the 1920s. I'd be walking around with my parents and people would look at me and laugh and say, you know, oh, look at the funny little man and things like this. And I, I was just, I mean, I was crying when I was sitting there. And every one of them wanted their message to get out. And so I, I felt like this huge responsibility was being put on to me to speak for them. And they said, Megan, you have nothing to worry about. You can see there's nothing to fear. And they said, we, we don't want to reincarnate to go back and um, give this message. Go back and tell them the message is love. Love is what it is. This is what generates the energy and the creation of everything, you know? 
So that's um, what I'm to do. And going back to sitting in temple, um, God ordered me to write a book, which I only just last year published and got out. I mean, because I got another visit from heaven. I've been getting visits since 2007. Um, they just show up, you know. And um, the last visit was, you have until November. So literally on 11, 11, 22, that's when my book was published. <laughs> I didn't plan it, you know. So, but yeah, there were um, beautiful, beautiful souls um, and beautiful messages from each of them. Um, I'm trying to remember who else, uh, what else they said. I mean, there was that concert. There was a going away party that they did for me. Um, God put these on for me. And, you know, I guess, I mean, I didn't believe in him. I can say that. I even questioned him in the Roman Catholic Church. I mean, like, who is this God thing? I mean, what is this all about? So then one day after my near-death experience, I'm, this is like a couple years after, I'm sitting at home and I'm watching um, National Geographic and up comes the picture of God. And I'm like, What? And they said, and this is the this is the face of Jesus. And it was the Shroud of Turin. And I'm laying there and I'm going, that's not Jesus. That's God, you know. And so his eyes were not open because he was showing disappointment in, um, you know, Jesus being murdered. And Jesus was the highest frequency of love on earth, just as Prophet Muhammad was. So they were equal in their ranks just at different periods of time. So you had your party, and then did you just happen to wake up in the hospital? Yeah, so eventually what happened was I get taken to, after crying, and I mean, there were so many other things that happened. Um, so I remember I was standing in a circle. There was a circle of um, ascended masters and saints and archangels standing around me, and then there were cherubs fluttering around. And I was crying because I didn't want to go back to earth. And they were all telling me, you have to, you have to go back now. You have more work to do. And I said, I don't want to go back. I just want to stay here. And they said, no, you can't. You can't now. You have to go back or you're going to have to reincarnate. Oh, that's right. Reincarnation. I'm not going to reincarnate again. No way. And um, so I... Um, I started crying and then each one of them put up their right hands, you know, at different times with different messages to me. And I don't remember the messages, but they were, they were short and sweet and filled with love. And they were um, doing the white flame from their hand onto my soul. And so then I stopped crying. And then I remember I was taken with Jesus and St. Germain. Um, I, I don't know how far the distance was where we walked. But then we wound up under this olive tree. And um, so St. Germain sat down and he was sitting in the shade and Jesus and I were standing talking. And, you know, Jesus looked at me and he says, OK, well, you have to go back now. And I said, Jesus, I don't want to go back. I, I really I cannot stand the thought of having to go back to Earth. I said, I've never felt more love in my life. I just want to stay here. And he said, well, and then he did this, like, you know, I'm sure it's like Jesus Psychology 101, where there was this little headshot picture of my then husband and my son. And my son was four years old at the time. And um, and both of them said in unison, telepathically, don't go, we need you. And so then I looked at Jesus and I said, oh, my gosh, my son needs me. I have to go back. And he goes, OK, well, you got to go back. So I said, okay. And then I gave him a hug and I started to leave. And um, as I'm walking down this dirt road, I had to, I knew that I had to go to this um, shack. There was this wooden shack and I had to take my um, robe off and the stole and put it in a wicker basket so they could, I don't know if that was like their laundry drop off point or whatever, um, but I dropped it off in there. So I had to go walking back into my body and out from, so to my left, was this like field of flowers and tall grass. And then there were trees behind it and Prophet Muhammad and all of the angels started walking toward me again. And so we, 
I, I went over to him as he's walking, like he's walking this way and I'm walking forward. So we meet. And then he said, um, oh, I can't remember what he said, but then I looked at him and I said, I have to go back. And he said, I know. And I said, I don't want to go back. And he said, Megan, you're going to be fine. He said, my hand is always at your back. I will always be there and giving you love and protecting you. And I was, I learned that to say thank you in heaven, you say blessings received. So I looked at him and I said, blessings received. And then um, I remember um, I asked him politely, respectfully, I said, may I give you, I said, I don't know if this is out of protocol or, but can I just give you a hug, you know? And he said, sure. And so I stood up on my toes because he was tall and I gave him a hug and I put my arms around his neck and then he hugged me at the same time. And then when I stopped hugging him, he, his hands were removed from around my back. And then I stood on my feet and I looked at him and I said, I love you. And he said, I love you too. And then I had to keep going. So as I walked down the road more, then I had to go through the clouds at some point, And then I woke up in my body. And I remember I, there was a nurse there um, and I looked at her and I just said, I just, I, I just saw Jesus. Cause that's what I remembered immediately. So it was, yeah, then I was back in my body. But since then I've gotten numerous visits from Jesus, from Archangel Michael, from God, from goddess, all at the same time, sometimes just one at a time. Um, one time it was me in the clouds with everybody who was in temple at the golden table. So the golden table was in the clouds and God was there and all of the cherubs and archangels and stuff. It was really amazing. And they had messages for me every time. Are these visits happening in your dreams? No, it's different than a dream. And I don't know how to describe it if you've never had a visit from somebody. Um, because technically, you'd say, oh, well, that's a dream. But at the same time, after it happens, and then they leave. Like one time I'm sitting with God. We're in the clouds. This is after my near-death experience. We're sitting in the clouds. He's sitting in this incredibly, like, his incredible golden chair and it has all of these beautiful gemstones in it diamonds sapphires emeralds rubies and he's sitting in the clouds and i'm sitting in just this plain gold chair square gold chair and the clouds are going over our feet and so i don't know how long we met for but he basically made a visit to me to tell me to write a letter to ellie wiesel and tell him that the pope was going to resign and so my then therapist, um, I, I called her, you know, the next day and I, I said, this is what happened last night. And uh, I, I don't know what to do, you know? And she's like, well, there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, okay, so you were asleep and da, 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 da. I didn't do it. I didn't write the letter. And so two days goes by. God comes back again because I didn't write the letter. And he said, Megan, why aren't you writing the letter? I, I've ordered you to write the letter. And I said, um, well, because I'm scared about what other people are going to think of me. I'm scared about what my husband's going to think of me. He's going to think I'm crazy. My therapist didn't really, you know, think anything of it. And he looks at me and he says, I don't care. I'm God. I'm not asking, you know, what your thoughts are or what their thoughts are. So write the letter. So I did. I wrote the letter. I never heard from him. It was signed for because I sent it um, signature required through FedEx. I overnighted it. And seven or eight days later, after, because um, I, I told my therapist, okay, you know, I sent the letter and she goes, okay, well, you're not, you know, you're not harming anybody. You're just telling him a story, you know? And so I said, yeah, I'm telling him a story. It's my story. I get it. But, um, yeah, I'm telling a story. So then I get a call at seven o'clock in the morning, about six thirty or seven in the morning. How did you know this was going to happen? And it was my therapist. And I said, what are you talking about? She said, are, are you not awake? And I said, no. And she said, turn on the TV. 
So I turned, she says, turn on CNN right now. So I did. And I saw the, you know, the smoke coming out of uh, the chimney at the Vatican. And it said Pope was resigning first time in over 600 years or something. And she said, how did you know this? And I said, look it, I told you, God came to me twice. And I, I, I don't know how to tell you. I mean, I don't, I can't make this stuff up, you know? So I've gotten different messages like that since then. That was like the biggest one that was like a world one. And I was really glad that I did the job, you know, that he asked me to do, because if I had to go, when I go back someday, I don't want to hear it, you know, later from my life review. So Megan, let's talk about this, why you didn't do it. See, we told you it was going to happen and you didn't do it, but I did, I did do it. So I don't have to hear that. To me, Jesus and the Shroud of Turin kind of look similar. It's kind of like a bearded man. Can you compare the way Jesus looked to the way God looked? Sure. So God had more of a golden tan, um, and Jesus was darker than him in his skin hue. Um, and how could he not be, you know? And so also Jesus had, um, God had gray hair and a mustache and a beard and a gray mustache and a beard at that. Um, whereas Jesus, he didn't have, I'm trying to, I didn't see him with a mustache and a beard. I, I saw him clean shaven or without mustache and beard, but a dark skin hue and beautiful, absolutely beautiful. Any picture that I've seen of Jesus since I was a kid, it doesn't do him any justice. If we go back to the beginning when you heard their voice telling you to make a scene at the hospital, yeah, I'm assuming that was one of your guides. Was that a male or female voice that you heard? I don't remember. It, it, it almost felt like genderless because I couldn't, I couldn't make a distinction. Is this male, female? I couldn't. And I didn't even think about, you know, differentiating. Is it a male or female? It was just like, okay, make a scene. Okay, I'll do it. Initially, when you first came back, were you angry or depressed that you were back? At first, I was really happy. I mean, because, well, actually, I was kind of both happy and sad, more happy. Um, I, I felt like, okay, well, you know, I had to come back. But, hey, I've got this TTPHUS. This is, this is a disease that not many people, you know, uh, live from, you know. And then I had HIT, heparin-induced thrombocytopenia, at the same time, shortly after coming out of the near-death experience. And so that normally kills people. I, you, I looked, I remember looking at God in heaven and I looked at him. There were, there were a few other meetings up there that I remember. And one time I looked at him and I said, um, he says, you're going back, Megan. And I said, but God, I have kidney failure. I've got TTPHUS. I've got HIT. I've got all these things coming. I've got, you know, C. diff colitis. I've got whatever else was going on. And he looks at me and he says, it's called a miracle. And I thought, oh man, you had to be Mr. Sarcastic with me. <laughs> you know? I mean, he knew, I knew he had a sense of humor and he knew I had a sense of humor. So it wasn't disrespectful. I was feeling that or saying that to him. I was just being myself. Like I wasn't cowering down because this is God. However, I'm not going to try and piss him off either, you know? So I don't want the wrath of God because that really does exist, as I have found out, you know? I mean, from being there in my near-death experience. Have all your physical ailments healed since you've been back? You know, it's interesting. Um, One second. Oh, you're back now. I was going to say I lost you. Yeah. Um, so my physical ailments, I'm, yes, the heparin-induced thrombocytopenia, gone. Um, the TTPHUS, I struggled for a number of years after coming back because 90% of my body had shut down. And that's what I was told by some nurses and a doctor. And two, one nurse, one doctor said, uh, at different points of me in the hospital, they said, I can't believe you're still alive. I mean, they literally, 
one nurse told me we were just trying to help you get comfortable because we thought you were dying and we wanted you to be comfortable while you were dying. And I said, wow, you know, and that was on the fourth floor before I got moved to the sixth floor. So yeah, it was like, it was, it was big, but anyway, um, I, now I feel so much better, you know, it's been 15 years since that time. And, um, yeah, I don't have any issues with anything. I mean, if it rears its head again, it could, it's stress induced, you know, primarily, but, um, I don't see it happening. So you mentioned the wrath of God. Did you yeah. see the wrath of God of like him punishing somebody up there or something? How do I respond to that? Let me see. I'm trying to remember. Now I remember Archangel Michael getting upset. I don't remember seeing the wrath of God play out, but I knew I would it was understood because he's a very powerful energy, you know, and I mean, his presence is so, like, uh, he owns the room, you know, he walks into the room, he owns it, and everybody goes, oh, it's God, you know, so you don't, there's no mistake that you understand he can do something, whatever he wants, but it's interesting because it's energy that he'll be sending you know, or that he sends and, um, energy can sometimes happen quickly and sometimes at a slower pace, but there's reasons for the speed in each case. How has your life changed since you've been back? Well, um, I divorced because, um, it, you know, after having a near death experience and, being an atheist previous to that and being, you know, with my then husband and he was raised Roman Catholic and then he was, you know, calling himself spiritual. I wouldn't say he's that spiritual, but I mean, he is kind of, you know, but nothing like, you know, the only time we went to church together were for, you know, family funerals. So it, it was not, it was nothing that we practiced. We didn't baptize our son. We didn't, you know, we didn't do anything like that. So I would, you know, I started meditating every day. I started praying. I would do a shrine in my, you know, one of my rooms and where I had flowers, like an altar, basically an altar. And, um, I just, I started reading, you know, like Psalm 91 out of the Bible. And, um, I've still never read the whole Bible, but it doesn't matter. You know, um, I, Psalm 23, I mean, just a few things, you know, and I've read revelations a few times now and I'm like, wow. So that started to make more sense to me. Um, but I, um, I'm definitely different. I actually have, um, a lighter feeling within me and, um, I know that everything happens for a reason. Um, I know that all of the things that plagued me um, psychologically in my upbringing and from what happened, you know, as a kid to me, um, the many things that happened, it doesn't matter. Everything had to happen because of reincarnation and past lives. And so what we couldn't do in a previous life, we come into the next life and we have to make up for whatever that life is that we, um, let's say we messed up somehow, you know, like we stole candy from the, the grocery store or, you know, I don't know. You can think of a number of different things, you know, um, I guess fill in the blanks, but you have to rectify the situation in human form. And the whole point in being reincarnated, which I didn't believe in before I got there. And it was God who informed me that reincarnation exists. And I looked at him, I said, that really exists? And he says, oh, yes. He says, and you've been around many times. And I thought, oh, my God, you know, <laughs> I mean, this is torture. So, but the whole point is to come back and clean your soul and cleanse your soul and learn love in each life. And so ultimately, I, you know, this is my last life, I found out. Um, I asked him, I said, why has my life been so rough? You know, we were sitting at the table when I very first got to heaven. 
And I said, why, why has it been so difficult? And he looked at me and he says, because, you know, you've chosen three lives in this one. And I said, what the F was I thinking? And he said, you were thinking you didn't want to reincarnate. And I said, oh, okay, that exists. You know, that's when he informed me and he says, absolutely, it exists. So as you're going along now, Megan, you don't have to reincarnate. You are going to live from this. But um, you have to go back and finish out your earthly duties. And then we'll welcome you back. After your experience, have you noticed that you have any new abilities that may be considered psychic that you didn't have prior? Yes, absolutely. So it started with um, hearing different things being said. And then, and then I would, I'd get messages for one of my friends and I called up and I said, you know, I don't know why I'm hearing this. And so as it turned out, that was really happening. And I don't remember what the messages were, you know, but this is how it started in, in small doses. And then I, um, I would meditate and continue meditating every single day and pray every single day. And then for years and years, it's only been the past six months where I haven't been doing it every single day, but, um, yeah, I, um, I definitely got, um, visuals brought in. Um, so I could hear something and then get like a silhouette or a visual in black and white. Um, I have, um, I've also gotten a scent of something, you know, like I'll smell something and it'll be attached to somebody, you know? So I actually started doing readings. Um, I channel, um, I just hear, see, feel, I'll, I'll get the, the feeling of what the person um, is feeling or the situation is feeling. It's, it's just, it just happened. Do you think that the other side is more real than here or dreamlike? No, I think it's, um, I think it's as real as here. So I've read things and heard things from people over the years, you know, um, that this is all an illusion. Well, to some degree it is, but at the same time, it's not because we're really living it. Our soul uh, said, yes, I will connect to that body and go in on earth and live out this life. So before we're born, this was one of the other things that God told me that I did, and he showed it to me. So we sign a contract or an agreement, if you will, before we're born and we sign it with God. And so I signed that I would be um, basically going through, you know, the bullet points in this life. But how I got to each um, point was by free will and choice. So, you know, if there's crying in there, if there's, you know, laughter in there, okay, well, you know, they didn't plan that, but they're telling you, you're going to have to go through this experience. But what happens between this experience and this experience, it's, it's just going to happen. I mean, whatever you choose to do, it's going to happen, but get ready because then there's another experience. And before you can come back here, you have to hit them all. You have to check each one off. And so I remember seeing that and I thought, wow, I had a checklist, you know, I had a checklist. So your soul is real in both realms. Now, what is more real there is love because it is all love that you feel there. Whereas on earth, it's not. And it's a much slower frequency rate here. So three earth days is one heaven day, I found out while I was there. Since you're not coming back next time, are you going to go somewhere else or just? No. To uh, no. <laughs> I told them all. I said, I am, an, even since 2007, I have said it numerous times. Don't you dare send me back to any other planet. I'm telling you ahead of time. I'm going to live out this life. Um, I, I do not want to do this again. No way. What? Nobody told me I didn't have to. What inspires you about your experience? That love exists. That love truly exists. Unconditional love, I should say. Where, you know, I'm standing there looking at my life review and I've got my guides around me and then I have to go in and meet God, but they're not judging me. I'm the one judging myself. 
you know, they're just being supportive. Do you feel that since you've been there and you've experienced love in a way that's impossible to experience here, it makes it more difficult to have relationships because you have too high expectations? Hmm, I never thought about it like that. I I really haven't thought about it like that. Um, I believe that um, there's a soul match, not just a soul mate, because, uh, you know, I used to believe in that, but a soul mate indicates to me that, you know, mating, you, it's like you're, you come and go out of the person's life, but a soul match means that you're locked in. And I really believe that it exists. Um, has it existed for me? Well, not so far. Do I know it's going to happen for me? Heaven tells me, you know, but I'm kind of like, okay, whatever, you know, whatever happens, happens. Um, but I do wish that our world would feel uh, unconditional love and the love that I felt while I was in heaven, because there I was unified with Sitting Bull, White Eagle, you know, um, Prophet Muhammad, Mahatma Gandhi was sitting there, um, Paramahansa Yogananda, Charan Singh, Goddess, all of these archangels, Jesus, you know, and not one of them looked at the, at the other and said, hey, I got this. Oh, that wasn't your specialty. You know, they didn't do that. It was everybody was all inclusive. Everybody was there to support one another. And that was so beautiful. And so if there's any message, you know, that they sent me back with, there were multiple messages, but that's another message where, you know, we choose as humans, we choose to not be supportive of one another. And we justify why we are or why we're not after watching this podcast people may want to reach out to you and ask you questions are you up for that yeah sure they can reach me um um, by email you know and if they want to do a reading with me they can let me know what's your email address it's m a l e c malik followed by the word alpha followed by the word omega at iCloud.com. You mentioned earlier that you have a book. What's the title of it and where can people find it? Okay, they can find it on Amazon and it's called A Catalyst, My Five Days in Heaven. And it's, I just want to like put out here that it's not about converting anybody to one way of believing religious wise. Like I don't get into religion, you know, it's not about that. It's just it's my story of why, why I believe now, you know, and how I got there, um, coming from an atheist point of view, and who's no longer an atheist. Before we finish up, can you leave us with one last positive message? Yes. And they kept saying it to me, and God said it to me, Jesus said it to me, Archangel Michael, Prophet Muhammad, all of these souls, goddess, they all said acceptance is synonymous with love. That is what they want us to know. Megan, thank you for that message and thank you for being my guest. Oh, thank you so much, Jeff, for having me. It's been a pleasure and I'm so happy to have been here. Thank you. Thanks for watching the Jeff Mara podcast. I really appreciate you. Another way to show support is through YouTube memberships. And if you do, there are loyalty badges and other perks depending on your level of membership. All you need to do is click the join button underneath the video to find out more. Thank you for your support.